So you saw the video title, I'm gonna ferment a pizza dough for 30 days and then bake it. The real question though is why? Well, you've probably heard before that when it comes to pizza, generally longer fermentations are better. That's because the long fermentation gives the enzymes in the dough time to break down the proteins and sugars in the flour, which creates more complex flavors and weakens the structure of the dough, leading to a softer chew. Personally, I find that usually two or three days is a sweet spot, but I've also realized that I've never really intentionally fermented a dough for much longer than that. I mean, if you're like me, you've probably accidentally left dough in the fridge for longer than you wanted, and it might've over-fermented just because the recipe wasn't designed with that long fermentation fermentation in mind. So in order to make a dough that can intentionally be fermented for that long, we need to make a few modifications. So for this experiment, I'm making four different doughs. One that I'm gonna ferment for 30 days, one for seven days, one for three days, and one same day dough. Now to keep things consistent, I'm using a hydration of 70% for all these pizzas. And I'm using King Arthur bread flour just because it's a decent mid to high protein flour that should be able to stand up to these longer fermentations. And the only other ingredients I'm including are salt at a baker's percentage of 2.5% and of course yeast. But in order to make these longer fermentations work, I need to vary the amounts of yeast for each recipe. Now, since I've never done on a 30 day fermentation before, I'm not exactly sure how much yeast I need. So I'm actually making two doughs here and hopefully one of them will have the right amount. For the first one, I'm using basically the smallest amount of yeast possible, just 0.01% as a baker's percentage, which in terms of weight is 0.04 grams. So in order to measure that accurately, I need to use my special scale, which can measure down to the 100th of a gram. Now you don't need one of these, but honestly, since I've gotten it, I've used it so much more than I expected to. This one is only like $9 on Amazon and it takes up very little space, so I'd highly recommend it if you do a lot of baking at home. Anyways, for my backup 30-day dough, I'm gonna use a bit more yeast, this time 0.05% as a baker's percentage, which in terms of weight is 0.2 grams. Now, I am also using a stand mixer for all these doughs just to make sure I'm developing the gluten fully and consistently. And I've mentioned in previous videos, but I always like to use ice water when using a stand mixer because it tends to warm up the dough quite a bit due to the friction of it. So after about five minutes, the ice was fully melted, and after about another five to seven more minutes, the dough seemed to be fully developed, so I transferred it to a separate container for the bulk fermentation. And checking the dough temperature, it was right about at room temperature, which is just where I like it. Now since these doughs have so little yeast, I actually decided to leave them out at room temperature overnight just to try to get some yeast activity going before I balled them up and threw them into the fridge. And comparing the doughs, you can see that the 0.05% yeast version did rise pretty significantly, probably close to doubled in size, whereas the 0.01% version didn't show much sign of activity at all. It did have a slightly fermenty aroma though, so I'll be very interested to see what happens over the next 30 days. Now I'm planning to make 14 inch pizzas, so I'm weighing the dough out to 380 gram dough balls and placing them each into their own dough tins. But I'm also going to try to make some 8 inches as a backup, so I'll form 3 of those and place them into a tin as well. Now since I don't want to have to keep these all in my fridge for an entire month, I'm actually just bringing them to the prep kitchen that I use for my pop-ups and throwing them into the walk-in cooler. And 23 days later, it was time to make my 7 day dough. Now for this one, I followed the exact same process, the only difference being that I used 0.25% yeast, or exactly one gram, to allow the dough to ferment faster. So after mixing, I only had to let it rise at room temperature for about three to four hours before it grew in size by about 50%, at which point I went ahead and balled it up and threw it into the fridge. Then four days later, I made my three-day dough. For this one, I used 0.5% yeast, and I let it double in size during bulk fermentation, since I'm not as worried about it over-fermenting here. So at this point, I've got three batches of dough in the fridge, all fermenting at different rates. So two days later, when I was about 24 hours out from baking, I figured it was about time to check on all of my doughs. All right, so we're about 24 hours out from baking, so I figured it was about time to check on all my doughs. So let's start with my 30 day doughs. Now I brought these home from the prep kitchen a couple days ago. I've just had them in my fridge, but you can see that they didn't really rise much at all. They pretty much just flattened out like pancakes. I can tell with the one that had more yeast in it that there's a little bit of fermentation activity going on. I mean, really both of them, there's at least a little bit of fermentation, but not nearly as much as I expected. Maybe I could have used a little bit more yeast, but I was also kind of afraid to over ferment them. So what I'm gonna do is leave these out at room temperature, probably for the whole next 24 hours until they're ready to bake. And I'll just keep an eye on them. If they seem to be proofing faster, then I'll throw them back into the fridge. But I think they're probably going to need that whole time, at least this one with less yeast in it. What I'm also going to do though, because these flattened out so much, I can tell that they don't have a lot of structure left in them. And if I were to stretch these out and bake them, even if they proof up a little bit more, they're not going to have the structure that I'm looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and re-ball these. And honestly, if I were to do this again, I would do a longer bulk fermentation instead of a longer balled fermentation just to prevent this issue. And you can see after 
I balled it up, there are some bubbles on the surface indicating that there's definitely some fermentation activity going on. Now, like I said, I'm gonna leave these out at room temperature still and just keep an eye on them, throwing them back into the fridge if needed until they're proof perfectly. In the meantime though, let's take a look at our others. Got our seven day dough and our three day dough so far. And again, tomorrow I'll also be making a same day dough. You can definitely tell, I mean, the seven day dough has flattened out significantly more than the three day dough, which is to be expected. I don't think it's flattened out so much though that I need to reball it. I'm just gonna leave it as is. And I think by tomorrow it'll be perfectly fine. Same thing with the three day dough. I mean, this is what I usually do. Obviously it's fine at this point. Since these ones are proofing a little bit faster though, I'm gonna throw them straight in the fridge now and then I'll just take them out tomorrow morning, maybe three to four hours before I plan to bake. So I'll see you tomorrow to make our same day dough. So when I got up the next morning, I was pretty hungry, and I figured what better thing to make for breakfast than pizza. In this case, I'm making a bacon, egg, and arugula pizza, and I'm prepping all of my ingredients using my favorite carbon steel pan from Made In, who was kind enough to sponsor this video. Personally, I think carbon steel is the perfect cooking material since it's conductive enough to get that super nice browning and crispness on foods, but it's also still very responsive to changes in heat. And this Made In skillet is super well made. This nice long handle makes it easy to maneuver, and the curved sides make flipping ingredients super easy as well. I mean, there's a reason reason that Maiden's cookware is used in multiple three Michelin star restaurants. Probably my favorite thing about carbon steel though is that it develops a natural non-stick coating over time. All I have to do after cooking is wipe it out and I'm good to go. So next I'm going to make my egg. I'll add quite a bit of oil to my carbon steel pan over medium high heat. Then I'll plop in my egg, season it with salt and pepper, and once it's set just a bit, I'll start basting it with olive oil. This is going to help the egg white to cook before the yolk has a chance to set too much. And you can see that that oil helps the edges of the egg to crisp up super nicely in this carbon steel pan. Now to assemble this pizza, I topped it first with some balsamic vinegar, then my cheese, then my crispy bacon, along with some pickled cherry tomatoes I had in my fridge. And after baking the pizza, I topped it with some lightly dressed arugula, and of course my beautifully fried egg. And you can see when I cut into it, the egg is super nice and runny with those perfect crispy edges thanks to my Made In carbon steel pan. So to get one for yourself, and to check out Made In's other cookware, click the link in my description to save on your order. So thanks again to Made In for sponsoring this video, and thank you for your support. So the last dough I have to make is my same day dough. And you know the process by now. With this one though, I used 1% yeast. And by the time I got it into its container, it took about another three to four hours to double in size, at which point I balled it up to let it finish its rise. Now in the meantime, I've gotten all of my other doughs to my ideal level of proofing. So it's time to start baking. And I figured I'd start with my three day dough since three days is my usual sort of gold standard. So this should help me to establish a baseline for this experiment. And as I was shaping it, this dough felt exactly as it should. It was nicely fermented, soft and full of life with plenty of air bubbles throughout. Now, in order to avoid wasting cheese, since I'm gonna be baking a lot of pizzas here, I'm actually just making these marinara pizzas. So I'm topping them with my usual New York style sauce, some fresh sliced garlic, and a little bit of olive oil before baking the pizza on my preheated baking seal. So I'll bake for about two minutes at 550 degrees Fahrenheit, then turn on the broiler and bake for about another two minutes until the pizza is done to my liking. All right, so as expected, this one looks pretty solid. Other than this one giant black bubble I got on the side, still trying to figure out how to avoid that. But with all these pizzas, I'm just going to top them with some fresh basil along with some Parmigiano Reggiano and then I'll give them a try. Really solid structure, nice crispness to it, great fermenty flavor. I mean, like I said, I don't really have many complaints about this. This is pretty much what I normally make. And there's a reason that I've settled on three days as my sweet spot. If I were to have one complaint about it, I would say it's maybe a little too chewy for my taste. So obviously that could be corrected by just using a lower gluten flour. Or in theory, maybe a longer fermentation would solve it as well. So I'll be interested to see if the seven day dough or even the 30 day dough improves upon this. But before we get there, let's take a step back and test out our same day dough just to see the difference that that makes compared to a three day fermentation. So when I took the dough out, the first thing I noticed was just how soft and pillowy it was. Compared to the three day dough, it was maybe a bit less airy and bubbly, but definitely smoother and softer. It took a bit more effort to stretch out since it didn't have as much time to relax, but overall due to its pretty high hydration, it was still easier than most dough. So I topped it and baked it exactly the same way. And about four minutes later, it was time to take a look at the results. So you can already see this one looks very different. And again, the only change we made here is the fermentation time. The same day dough has a lot more uniform crust compared to the more sort of rustic airy crust that we saw with the three day dough. Personally, I do like that more airy rustic pizza. So that's why I typically go with the three day dough. And you can see in the crumb, it's a lot tighter structure, more similar to like a classic New York slice as opposed to a more modern artisan version. Let's see how it tastes. 
So still a really good pizza. It's got pretty much the same crispness. Surprisingly, the chew isn't very different either, but there's no doubt that the flavor is a lot less complex. I mean, without those big air bubbles, you don't get those same aromatic compounds, along with sort of the complexity of flavor that develops during that longer fermentation. Again, still a great pizza in my opinion, and if you are short for time, I wouldn't say it's not worth making a same day pizza. But if you are willing to plan ahead, there's definitely a noticeable improvement with the three day version. And as I'm kind of getting to the crust as well, I'm noticing significantly more chewiness. I didn't really notice as much on the interior, but this one's definitely a bit harder to chew through. What I haven't really tried though before, at least not intentionally, is a seven day fermentation. So let's give that one a try. So at first, this dough looked pretty similar to the others. In the container, it looked really nice and airy. But when I took it out, I started to notice some big differences. Namely, it just felt a lot less structured, almost sort of lifeless. It also stretched out super easily. Gravity pretty much did all the work once I lifted the dough up. And as I stretched it out, it did seem to maintain a fair amount of those nice air bubbles from fermentation, so I still had some hope for it. But we won't know for sure what we're working with until we bake it. And here we are. Definitely looks a lot more similar to the three-day dough, as you would expect, but it definitely has some pretty significant differences. So it seems like it browned even a little bit more than the three-day dough, which I'm kind of surprised about because I thought that as the sugars got eaten up during fermentation, there would be less in there to make it brown. Let me give it a try though. I'm very curious to see what this texture is going to be like. Very interesting. So one thing I noticed is that there's a ton of these little micro bubbles on the crust. I don't know exactly what caused that, but it almost reminds me of like a bagel where it's boiled first, which creates all those little bubbles. And then when they're baked, they turn into kind of micro blisters. The other thing I noticed though is while it does have a little crispness to it, it also has sort of this weird hardness on the bottom that almost hurts your teeth to bite into. And that's something I've noticed before with dough that I've left to ferment a little bit too long. So it seems to be some sort of negative consequence of those longer fermentations. It's possible this was very, very slightly over fermented. Just because I could tell when I was stretching it out, it didn't have quite as much life in it, but that might also just be a consequence of a longer fermentation in general. Crustwise though, I mean, it's got a really nice airy structure, pretty solid crumb all the way throughout the slice. But overall, I still think the three-day fermentation was significantly better. Maybe with a little bit of tweaking, you can make this type of thing work. But I mean, why would you want to do that when you can just do a shorter fermentation and achieve better results? However, I'm still very curious what longer fermentations can do. So it's time for the moment we've all been waiting for, the 30-day pizza. And this one was very interesting, although not exactly what I expected. I decided to use the version with 0.05% yeast, since it had risen a bit more than the 0.01% version. But even so, the first thing I saw when I opened the container is that the dough had pretty much lost all of its structure. Even though it was just reballed one day before, it had already spread out into a sort of ugly blob as opposed to a nice dough ball. And that same trend continued as I shaped and stretched the dough. It just felt completely dead and lifeless. My guess is that over time, the gluten structure just became pretty weak, so much so that the dough was struggling to hold on to the gases produced during fermentation. And that theory was even further confirmed when I picked the dough up. It actually tore several times as I tried to stretch it, and I was able to patch it up for the most part before topping the pizza, but it definitely left the dough in a less than ideal condition for baking. All right, so this one looks very interesting. Because of that little mishap I had with the holes forming in the dough, it kind of stuck to the peel a little bit, and so I ended up with this wonky side here. But Either way, we'll still get the idea. Very interesting. So I will say it's not as kind of bad or weird as I thought it would be. It's definitely not great though. The crust has sort of a weird chewiness to it. I wouldn't quite say gummy, but it's almost just like a really chewy soft bagel and not really in a good way. The bottom crust also has that weird sort of hardness that I saw with the seven day dough. I will say though, the browning looks pretty solid, but really the main problem I have with this pizza is with the rise because I could tell when I was shaping it, the dough just felt really kind of dead and lifeless. And that obviously translated into the rise of the final pizza as well. There just didn't seem to be a lot of super strong yeast activity. And so I think that's the main problem with these long fermentations. I think with such small amounts of yeast, it just can't maintain its activity over such a long period of time. And even with that aside, I mean, I don't really notice a big flavor impact as well. It's not like it tastes super fermenty and alcoholic like you might expect. Weirdly, it kind of seems to taste like maybe other food that was in the walk-in cooler with it. I don't know if it's just in my head, but I feel like those scents were almost kind of infused into the dough 
dough and got translated into the flavor. But overall, I mean, with all this considered, I really don't see any point in doing such a long fermentation. I think the reason there is a sweet spot is because you need somewhat of a strong yeast activity in order to get that nice rise in oven spray. And therefore, of course, an airy crust. Like I said, maybe you could get the seven day fermentation to work if you really dial in the yeast amounts and the timing of everything. But this 30 day dough, I don't think it's ever gonna be worth it. Which I think is a good thing. I mean, imagine a restaurant trying to manage 30 different days worth of dough. It'd be a nightmare. So for me, I still think three days is a sweet spot. And that's probably what I'll do going forward. Speaking of which, that's exactly what I did with my New York style pizza recipe. So if you haven't seen that video, you can check it out right here. Either way, thanks a lot for watching and I'll talk to you in the next one.